Good morning, everybody. I had to use my, uh, my outdoor voice. Forgive me. Welcome to Grace Bible Fellowship. It's good to see all of you here today. What a beautiful day it is to be in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. To know that we're loved and we're forgiven by a God who knows every dirty little secret about you and loves you anyway. Who has forgiven you of all your sins, past, present, and future, and calls you to be free in him. What a blessing it is. Pray with me. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for your grace in our lives. Thank you for your Holy Spirit that lives and resides inside of us and your spirit that you pour out upon us even as we worship you. I pray that you might help each one of us, Lord, in our hearts and our minds as we come before your presence and as we present ourselves to you, that you would work in our hearts that which is pleasing to you. That any of those areas in our life of purposelessness or woundedness, Lord, that you might touch and bring healing today. That you might help us to understand how it is that you love us. Amen. Yes. Help us, Lord, to respond in kind with a heart of thankfulness. We thank you for this great day and the opportunity to look into your word. I pray that it might shape us into the image of your son. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we're back here in the book of Luke. We've reached chapter 5. It's an amazing speed at which we're running. Um, I don't know why I say that. I just feel like a failure whenever we don't read the whole Bible in one service. I don't know. <laughs> figure. If you remember, if you've read it, you'll, you'll remember that Jesus takes Peter out on a fishing boat. And it's the first of four incidences where Jesus has an encounter with four different people in chapter five. And I was hoping to get through all 39 verses, but it won't happen. <laughs> and so you'll have to hold your breath until next week for the other two people he confronts. But Jesus encounters Peter. It's a rather interesting story. And when he does this wonderful miracle in Luke 5, 8, it says, when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, depart from me for I am a sinful man, O Lord. As Jesus came and did this remarkable miracle uh, in front of a crowd and with Peter, uh, Peter is suddenly confronted with his unworthiness and he's brought to Jesus' feet. And it's like that when God shows his limitless love to us, isn't it? We just have a sense of our own unworthiness. So just to uh, recap where we've been and where we are. We looked at the, at the ministry of John the baptizer uh, and how he came in his special birth. And we also looked at the baptism of Jesus and how God the Father shows up and speaks over Jesus. And, you know, you're my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And how the people of Nazareth did not see him for who he really was. They saw him as, you know, the local kid. Isn't this Jesus who's, you know, brother and sisters we know, whose mother lives here? And then, of course, Jesus was drawn into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And it was the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. The same way that we're treated, the same that we're tempted. Jesus was tempted in all ways and yet without sin. And then we saw him give his basic uh, job qualification. He's telling us what he came for. He came for to anoint and to preach to the poor and to heal the brokenhearted. And everything that his uh, vision statement is, he declared to them. And of course, they rejected him, pushed him out towards a hill, and then they were planning on stoning him. But uh, Jesus parted the crowd and walked through them. And so he escaped his death, but it wasn't time for him to die. We looked at last week, a day in the life of Jesus, where Jesus woke up in the morning, he goes to synagogue, it's the Sabbath, he gets to read from the scroll of Isaiah, and as he does that, um, there are all of these people that come, I can only imagine living at, back in this time and walking with Jesus and seeing all of these things happen. Jesus coming home from 
synagogue and coming home to Peter's house. His mother-in-law is a hot mess and he heals her of this fever and she rises to her feet and immediately goes and begins to serve them, which is what we do when the Lord does a work in our lives. And we see towards the evening, because the Sabbath was over, all of the people in town brought all of their sick and their demon-possessed, and all of these people just ransacked Peter's house. Can you imagine uh, opening up your house to the disciples and suddenly finding out there's not just 12 of them, but there's an entire town that's coming out, and they're bringing all of their maligned, and their wounded, and their sick, and their ill, and their lame, and paralyzed, and Jesus heals every one of them. Didn't happen in Nazareth. It happened in Capernaum because Nazareth would have nothing to do with him. So the wonderful day in the life of Jesus, and then of course the morning comes and Jesus wakes up and he goes off into a remote place uh, somewhere along the Sea uh, of Galilee or the Sea of Tiberias. And he's spending some time with his father, getting his head on straight and his heart straight, much like what you guys do in the morning, I'm sure. And they find him. They, they're all looking, where's Jesus? Where's Jesus? And presumably all the people he's healed and all the other people that they're coming out to see Jesus. And so they find him and they find him on the, on the Sea of Galilee and they begin to ransack him and they begin to crowd him in. And that's where we come into chapter five, where Jesus is finally found at the Sea of Galilee. And they say, well, what are you doing? He says, well, I gotta, I gotta go. And they said, well, no, you don't have to go. You can stay here forever and ever and ever. <laughs> and he says, no, I have to go to other cities and preach to them as well. And so in the midst of all that, we find Jesus kind of cornered up against the Sea of Galilee, surrounded by all of these people in the morning in Capernaum. We pick it up in verse one. And so it was as the multitude pressed about him to hear the word of God, that he stood by the lake of Gennesaret and saw two boats standing by the lake. But the fishermen had gone from them and were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and asked him to put out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the multitudes from the boat. And when he had stopped speaking, he said to Simon, launch out into the deep and let your nets down for a catch. But Simon answered and said to him, Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. And when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish and their net was breaking. And so they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and to help them. And they came and they filled both boats so that they began to sink. And when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, depart from me for I'm a sinful man, O Lord. And for he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish in which they had taken. And so also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, do not be afraid. From now on, you will catch men. And so when they had brought their boats to land, they forsook all and followed him. So it's a nice story with a beginning, a middle, and a happy ending. But in the middle, there's all kinds of stuff. So let's pick it apart. Let's look at verse one. And so it was that a multitude pressed around him to hear the word of God. What a blessing it is to have a multitude of people coming to Jesus to hear the word of God. That's the way it should be, right? We see crowds usually pressing Jesus to get something. How good it is for them to come and want to sit and to learn and to listen. I don't know about you, but it's always difficult when someone comes up to me and says, hey, I need you to do something for me. Well, you, you might have a need for me to do something for you, but maybe I don't want to. <laughs> maybe I'm too busy. Maybe I got things going on that you don't know about. And yet they come to hear the word of God. What a blessing that is. And you know what? Every Sunday I'm overwhelmed with the fact that you guys would sit there patiently <laughs> and listen to my bozo weirdness. <laughs> but I know it's because it's the word of God, Amen. which is why I'll always stick to the book. They came to hear the word of God, which is as it should be. 
and they've got him basically cornered. And it says that he stood by the lake of Gennesaret and he saw two boats standing by the lake. But the fishermen had gone from them and were washing their nets. Because if you know anything about fishing, mm -hmm. you go at night because that's when the fish are there. They come from the deep parts and they come up into the shallows and you're able to catch them with a net. And so that's what they do. And we know that they went out all night and they were fishing because Peter says so. And we know that they caught nothing. Peter, the great fisherman, caught nothing. Now this is their livelihood, okay? I mean, we've seen lots of businesses go out of business because of COVID. And so you know what it's like when people don't show up and people aren't allowed to come to your place, you go out of business. I mean, you walk through the mall, it's like a ghost town. It's uh, going to become like, you know, those ghost towns out west with tumbleweeds and stuff. <laughs> and so this is his livelihood, which means, you know, he, he worked all night, but he didn't get paid, which is kind of a slap in the face. Yeah. So Peter's in this discouraged mode and they're cleaning their nets. By the way, you have to clean the nets. If you don't clean them out, what happens is they begin to form bacteria and mold and they get kind of slimy and nasty. And when they dry out, they crack. So what you have to do is rinse them all down, make sure they're clean. You take all the junk out of it, you know, the sticks and seaweed and all of that kind of stuff. You get all that out and you clean your nets and you make sure that you can go out the next day. And so he's working the night shift and it's the morning. He's ready to shut down and they're cleaning their nets, which means they're done for the day. And Jesus sees two boats and they're empty because these guys are, you know, off. They've punched out. And so what's he do? He jumps in one of the boats. An apparent boat jacking. <laughs> it says it right here. Then he got in one of the boats. The fishermen aren't around. Now, if someone got in your car when you weren't there, <laughs> unless it was Jesus, of course. But then he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's. And you think that was an accident? Now, see, we know about Simon because he calls Simon. He, he's introduced. Andrew brings him and, and says, this, this, is, this is my brother Simon. He goes, your name is Simon. You'll be called Peter, which means rock. So, uh, you know, Simon means eh, unreliable. <laughs> he vacillates. You can't trust him. Bipolar. He's here. He's there. And, you know, Peter demonstrates that pretty clearly, I think. But Jesus says... Your name is Simon, but I'm going to call you Peter because that's what he makes him. Amen. He makes him a rock. So we've been introduced to him, but see, Simon isn't a full-time follower of Jesus yet. He's still gone home. He's got his personal business. He's met Jesus. He's traveled a little bit with him, but now Jesus is in his hometown. And so he's just going about his business. You know, it's dad's business and you know, we're in it. We got a couple of partners. And so he's parked his boat and Jesus jumps in. But Simon asked him to put out a little from land. And so he sat down and he taught the multitudes from the boat. Because if you know anything about the sea, it, it's very hilly going up. And so all of these people are coming and kind of have Jesus cornered and they're all pressing in, you know, a little like wanting to be first in line, you know, or being at a concert and you have floor seats. Everybody can just flood the front. That's why they have security and guards and all that kind of thing. And, but Jesus doesn't have that. And so they're pushing him back and pretty soon his feet are wet. <laughs> and there are people that just keep coming and just keep coming. And Jesus gets this great idea. I'm going to jump in the boat because apparently there's nowhere for him to stand. So he jumps in the boat. And I can imagine, you know, Peter cleaning his net and he's, yo, what are you doing in my boat, man? That, that's what I would say. But. but Jesus gets in his boat and, you know, you might think it to be a strange thing, but what an honor that Jesus would select his boat to be there and make that his podium where he can go out a little bit. He tells Simon, Simon, just put it out a little bit little bit further so I've got some room and I can speak to these people and I can see them. And as any good rabbi would do, he sits down, which was the tradition. So you should all be standing while I sit. <laughs> and Jesus begins to teach them from the boat and he teaches them all these wonderful things and they've come to hear him preach the word of God. And so that's what they get. When he was done speaking, he turns to Peter and he says, hey, 
Why don't we go out into the deep, catch some fish? Let down your nets. I want you to notice the plural. Put down your nets so we can go get a catch. You're talking to a guy who's just worked all night and caught nothing. Jesus, the master, the rabbi, the teacher is saying, let's go fishing. It's the middle of the day. This is when people go fishing, right? You don't catch fish in the middle of the day. And you don't go into the deep because that's not where they are. They're in the shallows. You go at night and you fish in the shallows. Now, Simon, being gracious at this point, doesn't educate Jesus on how to fish. He could have told him, listen, master, you know, everything I just heard was pretty cool, but I don't think you know anything about fishing. <laughs> so, you, you know, I don't know if you guys get excited about fishing. How many of you are excited about fishing? It's one of the only things that'll get you up early and you got to get everything together. You get everything together. And you're, I remember as a kid, we used to do this. We'd throw all our stuff on the handlebars of our bikes and it looked like, you know, we were homeless or something. And we're driving and we would drive while it was still dark and cold. And we would drive down to this place, Johnson Park and, uh, on the other side of Edison. And we would, uh, we would follow this canal and we would go fishing. And, you know, we had, we had the biggest worms and, you know, we had everything. And we thought for sure we were going to catch the world and we caught nothing usually. But it was a lot of fun. It was like the little rascals. It's the way I felt. <laughs> but Jesus is exuberant. He's like, well, now that, now that I'm done and I'm punched out, let's go catch some fish. Let's put your nets out into the deep and let's get a catch. That's the way I see him seeing it. He's, ex he's excited. And Peter's like, I've been up all night. I didn't catch anything. So Simon answered and said to him, Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. Jesus said, let's go out into the deep and I want you to put out your nets for a catch. And Simon says, well, listen, we fished all night. We got nothing, but because you say so, I'll go out and throw one. I'll put a net out. Don't we respond to Jesus like that sometimes? Yeah. Yeah. You know, he says, this is what I want you to do. And he gives you this thing to do. And you go, well, I'll give it a half effort. Yeah. <laughs> That's how Simon responds. How many of you saw that? You better see it now. Okay. So there's, he says, yet at your word. Now here's this little bit of faith that he has. Yet at your word, I'll go and put out a net. There's that little spark, and that's all that Jesus needs. Just that little spark of faith. And so he's, first of all, he got in Peter's boat because he had a captive audience to preach to. Not the people. Peter. He kept Peter close and got in his boat, I think, because he wanted Peter to hear the sermon. I think Peter needed it. One of the benefits of doing what I do is that I get to hear the sermon before you. And Jesus gets to preach to me as a captive audience before I ever speak to you. So in that, I'm a little like Peter. So he says, net, yet at your word, I will go and put out the net. And so he packs up some help and they jump back in the boat with their nice clean nets that they just cleaned, that they're going to get all dirty all over again. Now, I know that you feel this. Just when you think you're done with something, somebody comes and adds to your agenda. Just when you think you're out, they pull you back in. And now you're, now you're going to work all over again, and your day has now gone big. And yet Jesus asks us to do that, doesn't he? And you already know the rest of the story. So you know how we should always be open to do what the Lord tells us to do, because there's always something waiting on the other side. And so I'll go out and let down my net. <laughs> In 1 Corinthians 8, 2 and 3, it says, if anyone thinks he knows anything, he knows nothing yet as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, this one is known by him. If you think that you're an expert at anything, if you think that you really know a lot about any particular issue, 
you don't know as you should. Because there's always something you can learn from someone else. And here Jesus is coming to an experienced fisherman and telling him in the middle of the day to go out into the deep and go catch fish. Which to Peter seems ridiculous. But because it was Jesus who said so, he humored him. And he'll go throw a net. I think it's an interesting story. It sounds a lot like me. 1 Corinthians 1.25 says, Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Amen. The ridiculous and weird things that you have to go through, either in your suffering, difficulties, your shortcomings, your hardships, all of those things where you say, you know, Lord, I don't know what you're doing here. I don't know why you let this person in my life. I don't know why you let me experience this. I don't know this. I don't know that. But because you're in it, I'm going to look for whatever it is you want to teach me. Amen. That's that little bit of faith that Peter had. And when they had done this, notice after they were obedient to do what Jesus said, they caught a great number of fish and their net because there was only one, was breaking. I wonder if they would have got a double portion if they put down more than one net. And so the net that has been cleaned and cared for very well is so full of fish, they can't contain the blessing. You know, that's what Jesus wants to do. That's what he wants to do for you and me, if we would just listen. And so there they are, struggling with all of these fish. And here's Peter with egg on his face, so to speak. Like, are you kidding me? I've never caught fish like this ever. And this is more fish than I've ever caught before. And my net is breaking. The reason I say that is because his net never broke before. It was, they were just mending their nets. And now the nets are breaking. There's so much. Just when you think that there'll be a zero... The Lord brings you to something more than you ever imagined. And so they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both the boats so that they began to sink. Great. It was more than I could handle. I called for some friends. They came over. We began to pull the fish into our boats and both boats are going down. There are more fish than their boats have ever seen in any one catch. And Jesus is there and they're sinking. I don't know if you've ever had an elation and then suddenly tragedy begins to strike and it's more than you can handle. And, but it's a really interesting shift of gears and emotions. Now they're sinking. And by the way, the crowd that Jesus just preached to is still on the shore watching all of this. Can you imagine that? <laughs> they're going out. They're not going to catch anything. I can't believe it. <laughs> Jesus doesn't know what they're doing. Oh, my goodness. Look what they're doing. Oh, my goodness. Look at that. Hey, look. Look, look at all the fish you catch. Look at all of them. I don't know about you, but when people are catching fish, even if it's on a line, yeah. I'm excited. I got to go over. What do you got? <laughs> These guys got a net full, and, and the crowd is watching. So they call over for their partners who are probably still mending their nets like, <laughs> no, they won't catch anything. <laughs> and they're calling for help. And so now they're running out there to help pull the net. And now, thanks, now, now we're sinking. <laughs> Jesus is like that. And when Simon Peter saw it, notice he's singled out. He fell down at Jesus' knees saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish in which they had taken. Peter's inward cockiness suddenly went to total humility. And he realizes that this is no ordinary rabbi. This is the son of God who's in his boat who has single-handedly selected him to go out and catch fish and blessed him with this catch to the point where two boats couldn't hold all the fish without sinking. 
You ever have the Lord do something amazing in your life and you just suddenly feel completely unworthy of it? That's a good thing. When faced with greatness, that should be our response. It shouldn't be any kind of a greedy, thankless attitude. It should be a very humbling thing that the God of heaven would love you so much to give you a blessing of such a thing. In Job, he was overwhelmed when the Lord spoke to him. And in chapter 42, he says, I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Therefore, I abhor myself and I repent in dust and ashes. Job had a very similar experience when God addressed him in the midst of his suffering and God addressed him. And he said, I think, I think you've outgrown your britches a little there, <laughs> Job. Because he says, I wish I was dead. I wish I was stillborn. I wish I was a, a miscarriage. And that's when the Lord steps in and says, wait a minute, I think you stepped over the, over the line there, Job. And then after the Lord says, you know, where were you? Where were you when I set the sea? And I said, you'll go this far, no further. When the land appeared. And he gives him this whole thing about who it is to be God and determine all these things. And Job said, you know what? I put my hand over my mouth. I've got nothing to say. That's a normal response to having an encounter with Jesus Christ. We're humbled and we see ourselves as God sees us. In Isaiah 6, 5, Isaiah had a similar experience when he saw the Lord and he says, so I said, woe is me for I am undone because I am a man of unclean lips and I dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. It's a natural thing that when we come face to face with God and we see ourselves as we truly are, that we're suddenly humbled. Have you had that experience? It's not something that happens once. It's something that happens over and over and over. And I don't know about you, but when I get busy and I run around and I have things to do, places to go, people to see, I can forget the presence of God. And I can just forget about him and get focused. And yet there are times when he brings me back to reality starkly and I'm just so overwhelmed by his grace. That's what it is to have a relationship with the Lord God of heaven through Jesus Christ. And so back to our story, for he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken. That's the look of astonishment. And so also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, do not be afraid. From now on, you will catch men. And so when they had brought their boats to land, they forsook all and followed him. This is the point at which they say, we're done. We're done catching fish. One day with Jesus, I'm done. I'd rather be with Jesus than be out there catching fish all night, not catching fish. <laughs> because see, a day with Jesus will yield way more than trying to do things all on your own. And it's always like that. And suddenly, Simon has a new profession. Uh, this gives the answer to the question, what did Jesus catch on his fishing trip? <laughs> Jesus caught four disciples. Peter and Andrew and James and John. The, bro the, the sons of thunder. The brothers Zebedee, who were always on fire for the next thing that God was going to do. So Jesus went fishing and caught two, had four disciples. The disciples went fishing and caught a bunch of fish. I think Jesus made out better. And later on, Jesus goes fishing for Peter. Because Peter, walking on the water, loses faith and begins to sink. And then Jesus has to fish him out of the water. The very same water in which he called him from. I just find that an interesting parallel. There's also another time when Jesus shows up after his resurrection in John chapter 21 when Simon decided he would go fishing again. He kind of backslid back into his old occupation. And they fished all night and caught nothing. And suddenly a voice from the shore says, children, do you have any food? And they said, no. 
And he said, throw the net on the other side and you'll have fish to spare. And John, the apostle John is in the boat and he goes, it's Jesus. And so they hurry up and throw the net on the other side of the boat and they have more fish than they can handle. Peter does something very unusual. He puts on all of his clothes and jumps in the water in an apparent suicide. And he swims to Jesus because he's done. He's done. He got caught fishing for fish. And he's not going back. Not for his coat, not for his shoes. He's taken it all and he's done. And he lets them struggle out there with the fish. Jumps ship, literally. But there are times when Jesus has to fish us out of the drink too. There are times when we backslide back into old habits and old ways that we thought would work and we know that, you know, there's no fish there. There's nothing there. And so, these four encounters with Jesus in chapter five, this is the first of four. Jesus intrudes gently and progressively. We should respond in faith. He just jumps in, jumps in his boat, doesn't ask him. He sees Simon's boat, it's empty gets in the boat. Jesus is a gentleman, but he does it gently. We sometimes think that we know better what to do. We don't. When the Lord asks us to do something or to give beyond what we think we're able or to help in a way that we don't think, you know, we're the right person, you know, Lord, why don't you choose somebody else? Go choose anybody else, but not me, like Moses did. And yet the Lord knows better than we do. And we need to just trust because he knows better than we do. Have your nets prepared and ready, even in lean times. Because you never know when the Lord's going to want you to fish for men or women or children. Always be ready to take in a catch wherever the Lord may find you. Trusting him is the only way to participate in the miracle in which he wants to do. We have a responsibility to show faith and trust when the Holy Spirit leads you and guides you. We need to get out there and get it done. Even if you don't think it's going to be fruitful, even if you think the conversation isn't going to go anywhere, even if you think it's not worthwhile saying the same thing to the same person again, because they never listen. You probably don't have people like that in your life. I do. (laughs) Trusting in him is the only way to participate in the miracle. We need others to fully enjoy the fullness of his abundance. You see, the blessing that God wants to give is not just for you. It's to be shared. And what a blessing it is to share. I'm, I'm blessed to be part of this church and to know that there are people that can put crosses on steeples and people who take care of cleaning the bathrooms for you people and people who count up the offering. And so I don't have to know who's giving anything. So I, my motives don't get all messed up. I praise God that I'm not the only person here. I, I, might, I might have the spot in the spotlight right now, but I'm not the only person that's part of all of this. And God has brought a team of people. And I'm thrilled to have every one of you, by the way. We need others to fully enjoy the fullness of his abundance. And God's blessings are to be shared. It's not something that's just for us. It's for more than just us. And God's goodness leads us to repentance. When Peter went to his knees and he says, Lord, you got to leave me. I'm, I'm the wrong guy for this. You, you picked the wrong guy. I'm, I'm a wicked, horrible, terrible human being. And you know, you need to find somebody else. When confronted with God's goodness, it leads us to repentance. It leads us to change, to see ourselves as he sees us. And we need that. He calls us all to be fishers of men, the fishers of people. And whether he's preaching from a pulpit on a fishing boat or it's from a pulpit here that you hear it or whether it's sitting down in your morning devotions or in your evening readings, God has called every one of us to share the abundance of what he's given to us with other people. And we need to respond fully to his call because if we don't, we're going to miss it. If we don't put down our nets, plural, we only get half the blessing. So we need to respond fully instead of, okay, Lord, well, because you said so, I'll go and I'll 
put down a net. No, we need to put down our nets and be all in. And that's when we experience the full blessing and when the Lord can do it, even a double miracle. I don't know what that would have looked like, but it looked pretty good as a single. And don't look back. You know, Peter ended up going back to what he was familiar with. And when he did, he didn't catch anything again. Sometimes we don't learn and we go back to a well that's dry or we go back to a, a, a way of living that doesn't produce any fruit in our lives. It might be worry. It might be anger. It might be some bad habit. But it never fulfills. It never does. It's not meant to. And so we move forward and don't look back. Just do what the Lord calls us to do. The second person that Jesus meets in verse 12 and it happened when he was in a certain city that behold, a man who was there full of leprosy saw Jesus and he fell on his face and he implored him saying, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. I'm not sure that any of you have ever seen somebody with leprosy, but this is someone with leprosy. It's a skin disease, which is 100% curable now. But the word given for this man is he was full of leprosy. This wasn't like a spot. This wasn't just a little bit. He was full of leprosy. And Luke's, Luke's a doctor, so he knows what he's talking about when he says full of leprosy. When people get it, it deadens the skin to the point where you can't feel things. There are people that wrap themselves up, and you, you usually see, like in the movie portrayals, these people wrapped in things. They do that so when sleeping, the rats don't chew them because they can't feel it and it doesn't wake them. And so this is the progress of what happens with leprosy. It begins with a numbness, and then you start getting cuts, and they don't heal well, and you can't feel things. And you, you might not appreciate pain in your body. Nobody likes it but it's better than not feeling pain. It's like football players that get an injection halfway through the game so they can play the rest of the game and then they're, you know, then they're hospitalized for the rest of their life. Pain is actually a, a decent thing that we need to do so that we don't overdo things. And there are people that get healed of leprosy and yet there are still things that they carry with them, scars in their body and parts of their body who, that they lose and they become gangrenous. It's a, it's a very, very sad thing. And there are, even though it's 100% curable, and one of the ingredients is actually aspirin, a uh, very common thing, th there are still people throughout the world that still have it. And of course, they collect in colonies. And so you tend to be with people who have leprosy like you, and uh, they all together stay apart from each other. Uh, and in the, in the Bible times, uh, they were told to stay away. They had to warn people when they were coming they would have to cry out, unclean, unclean. And they'd have to let everybody downwind know that they were coming because it's communicable. You could get it from clothing. You can get it from a touch. And so here comes this man who has leprosy. And he falls on the ground with his face to the ground. And he says, Jesus, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Think of that statement. If you are willing. He didn't have a problem thinking that Jesus could do it. He just didn't know that Jesus would do it for him. Do you, do you understand that? I have all kinds of faith for you people. I know what the scripture says and I believe every single one of the promises are for you. But it's difficult for me to imagine that God means them for me. And so here he is, leprous, coming to Jesus and saying, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Notice the faith. You can make me clean if you're willing. It, when you think about it, it's almost a smack in the face of Jesus, like you don't care. And sometimes we think whatever it is we're going through, it's, we go through it because God doesn't care enough to do anything. If you're willing, you can make me clean. And he put out his hand, this is Jesus, by the way, and touched him. And saying, I am willing, 
be cleansed. Immediately, the leprosy left him. Jesus touched this man with leprosy. You don't do that, right? Somebody that's got some highly communicable disease, you don't ever touch them. In fact, I don't touch people if they don't smell good. I mean, I, you're not getting a hug from me if you don't smell good. Or not. I'm trying to get used to that. But Jesus reaches out and holds him, grabs him, touches him. By the way, he's not been touched by anyone. You know, we take for granted, we're, we're a real huggy church. We just love each other to death in that way. This man doesn't know what that's like. No one touches him. He doesn't hold hands. He doesn't hug anybody. There's not been a kiss on his face. There's none of that. He hasn't been touched by another human being. Jesus touches him because he has compassion. And instead of the disease that's on this man getting on Jesus, what's on Jesus gets on him. Amen. And that's the way it is when we spend time with him. First Timothy chapter 2, 1 to 6 says, Therefore I exhort first of all that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. You wonder what to pray about. There's, this is a list. Everyone. And by the way, it's women included. For kings, starting at the top, and all in authority, that we may lead quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. You want to know if Jesus is willing to save someone, the worst person you can think of. Is he willing to save them? Absolutely, he's willing. His will is that they all become saved. So does he will us to say anything to them? I think so. For there is only one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. By the way, you can go right to the top. who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. You don't need to go through some intermediary. You don't need to pray to an angel. You don't need to pray to a saint. You don't need to talk to his mother. Go right to Jesus. He touched him. How many of you had Jesus touch you when you were unclean and leprous? Amen. Immediately it left him. Not like the tricks that you see on TV with guys doing weird stuff and pretending and mimicking what they've seen in the Bible. No shows. Jesus touches him and he's immediate, immediately made clean. Poof. Yes. It's the only kind of magic that's real and worth seeing. And he charged him to tell no one. If you were leprous and you were healed and Jesus touched you and he said, don't tell anybody. What? <laughs> How many of you have a hard time keeping a secret? <laughs> Christmas, birthdays, I don't know, intimate things. Good thing you're not a pastor. Because it's very difficult to keep a good secret. And this is like a good secret, okay? He charged them to tell no one, but to go and show yourself to the priest to make an offering for your cleansing as a testimony to them, just as Moses commanded. A any of you read through Exodus recently? Or Leviticus? Deuteronomy? You know those long passages with names of people you'll never meet until you get to heaven. And, you know, son of, son of, so and so, and having to pronounce all those things. I, I resist cutting short all those sections, but I, I, I'm tempted. Jesus tells him not to tell anybody. And you go, well, why would he tell him not to tell anybody? Well, if you go to the book of Mark chapter one, we're given the same instance here. And the scripture reads this way. Now, a leper came to him, imploring him, kneeling down to him and saying to him, if you are willing, you can make me clean. It's all right here, right? Then Jesus moved with compassion, stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I am willing, be cleansed. 
And as soon as he had spoken, immediately the leprosy left him and he was cleansed. And he strictly warned him and sent him away at once because there's a crowd there. And he said to him, see that you say nothing to anyone, but go your way, show yourself to the priest and offer your, uh, for your cleansing those things which Moses commanded as a testimony to them. However, he went out and began to proclaim it freely and to spread the matter so that Jesus could no longer openly enter the city, but was outside in deserted places and they came to him from every direction. The reason he didn't want to tell him is because he realized it was going to make a stir and then everybody was going to come for the show. Jesus didn't want to be famous. Jesus didn't want to be the center of attention and he didn't want people to come for the entertainment value, which is why I don't do enter any entertaining up here. I just... And it ruined his ministry. You know, sometimes Jesus will tell you to keep your mouth shut and you don't want to. If he tells you to keep quiet, keep, shh, keep quiet. And suddenly they were inundated with people. I mean, can you imagine spending the day at Peter's house and now suddenly this guy has told everyone and Jesus wakes up to go have his private time and there are people camped out everywhere. It's like Woodstock outside Peter's house. He couldn't even go get quiet time and prayer, which is where his strength came from. And if he did it, certainly we should. In Leviticus 14, it's, a, it's an interesting section. Leviticus 14, the entire chapter is about what happens when you're cured of leprosy. There's no cure for leprosy back, back then. If you had leprosy, you had leprosy for life and it was a death sentence. So why in the world would God tell Moses, hey, I want you to put this whole chapter in. So if somebody gets leprosy and there's, if you read it, it's an amazing thing. You have to get two birds and you have to sacrifice one and there's oil involved and cedar and a ribbon and, you know, then running water. And you have to take the live bird and dip it in this thing and take some oil and, you know, flick it on them seven times. And there's all of this stuff. And then you have to go home, shave your head. You got to take everything out of your house. You have to sleep outside for seven days. There's like this whole long thing that you made me memorize. <laughs> and, and it's just incredible all of the pictures it, it pictures the sacrifice of Jesus Christ and his death it also shows his resurrection which is the live bird being let go and the oil is the Holy Spirit and all of these things have deep 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 meaning and I, I don't have enough time to go into it but so here's this, this thing that you're to do if you're cured of leprosy, and the only one I know of off the top of my head is Naaman the Syrian who wasn't even a Jew. And so he says, I don't want you to tell anybody, but go to the priest and tell him and make these sacrifices, and there's a lamb involved. And presumably he didn't do that. And it would have been a testimony to these people that are the hardest hearted people to reach. Religious people are really hard to talk to. Did you ever notice that? <laughs> and he didn't do it. And what they do is they actually look you over, you shave your head and, and you know, they check you out and you stay outside for seven days and all that. And when you're declared clean, the priest brings you in front of the congregation of people and declares them clean, which is restoring you to fellowship. A man who was never touched, Jesus touched. And now he has this whole new life where he's able to have community, fellowship, intimacy with other people on a level that you and I just take for granted. It's a blessing. And so Jesus heals him immediately. However, the report went around concerning him all the more and great multitudes came together to hear and to be healed by him. Notice they didn't come just to hear the word anymore of their infirmities. And so he himself often withdrew into the wilderness and prayed because the people just continued to come and they all had desires and they all wanted something from Jesus. And Jesus at times, I'm sure, just wanted to get away and be with his heavenly father and pray. And he found it very difficult to do that from then on. 
because of this man's testimony. And so everybody hanging at Peter's house, waiting for Jesus to come back from his quiet time, his workload building up, you know, like the guy who has the inbox with the stack of papers like this and out boxes, you know, this big. So Jesus has a confrontation and encounters these two people. In thinking about the things that, I, that I've been talking about and that I've been studying, I just wrote down kind of a synopsis. We are full of leprosy. We try to hide it by withdrawing from intimacy with others and hide our shame. In our pride, we do not come to Jesus for cleansing. We don't even think he's willing to repair our damage. He is. And will heal us if we only humble ourselves and ask. Once cleansed, be careful how to, how and to who, uh, to what extent you share this newfound restoration to those who would not believe or appreciate the sacred cleansing. Declare your freedom in the sanctuary of God and be engaged in fellowship around this event. We all have a similar story. Gather with Jesus often in the isolated places where he can be found so that you can grow in knowledge and wisdom and grace. I try to boil it all down so that you guys get to go away with something. I pray that the Lord has blessed this time for you and that he's spoken to your heart in these two incidences where Jesus has an encounter with somebody. As the worship team comes up, I'd like you to think about the things that the Lord has spoken to your heart this morning because that's really what's important. And for you to go away with it intact so that you can do those things that the Lord has put upon your heart, I think is a sacred and valuable thing. And it will be meaningful for me to see that you guys do that. Let's pray. Father, we humbly come before you and with the words of Peter, we're unclean people. Lord, we're damaged and broken in so many ways. And yet, with just the touch of your hand, we could be made clean. I thank you, Lord Jesus, that through the sacrifice of your body and your blood that we have life in your name and that we have a guarantee that you are continuing to wash us and to cleanse us and to free us from all the scars of the past. Lord Jesus, touch every heart here this morning in mind and body and in heart. I pray that you might bring fullness that you might strengthen every one of us, Lord, that we would be immediately healed, much like the leper, that we would be able to share with wisdom those things that you've done and give you all the praise and honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.